have on Wednesday faculty evaluation. So you have to evaluate me and Dr. Masab and Dr. Shukrullah and Innocent and everybody else. Okay. So, and then I will have to evaluate you guys too. How is that so much fun? That's more fun. <laughs> yeah. Please. Thank you. You get bonus because you're the only one who asked question today. Yeah. <coughs> First 10 minutes should be all this question. Yeah. What about achalasia? Okay, so what are patients eat? And you know, I, I'm wearing this, and then there's this is loud, so please speak up. So when patients eat, um, yeah. if they take a deep inhalation, will that help with the LDS or running up? If they take deep inhalation, yeah. you know when you inhale air? No. A little bit. Just okay. because of the diaphragm contraction. A little bit, but not really. So it doesn't make that. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you have to think about it this way. <coughs> It's actually when the diaphragm is <coughs> relaxed, so when diaphragm contracts, you know, it squeezes. When it relaxes, it opens up the uh, esophageal hiatus. If you get confused, how are you going to think about it? Think about it this way. I know people will tell the difference. So when you inspiring air, should you be swallowing at the same time? No. So that's why you shouldn't be eating at the same time too. So it's designed that they coincide together. Yeah, so when you're ins inspirating, you know, the diaphragm is contracting. When it's contracting, actually, <coughs> the valve is being pushed. Mm -hmm. So it will help. No, that's... Oh, you, you're talking about LES in that book, right? Right. Remember I told you to switch? Yeah. Yeah, you probably stepped out. Maybe you had some gorgeous lady waiting for you to call her or something, I don't know. It's okay, keep it. Say yes, say yes. Never say no. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what page is that? 13? Yes. Page 13. On page 13 on echalasia, when you have the last two sentences under the underlying pathology, switch them. Switch them. Yeah. Okay. We had a question on esophageal varices. The most common cause female. Okay, so what he's saying is <clears throat> there are two major causes of um, esophageal varices, submucosal esophageal varices. One is alcohol and the other one is uh, hepatic vein thrombosis, correct. If it is a female who is pregnant and she's drinking, she's alcoholic, she shouldn't be pregnant in the first place. No, no, yeah. So, oral contraceptive. Yeah, if, if she's on oral contraceptive pills, yeah, okay, not pregnant, right? No, no. Okay. So she's taking birth control pills and she's alcoholic. What is the most likely cause of her? Varices. Okay. <clears throat> now. Okay, so how old is she? Okay. If I want her to be in her 30s, then it's most likely hepatic vein. If I want her to be in 40s and 50s, then cirrhosis is more common. So it takes for alcohol to cause cirrhosis how long? Very long time, very long time. But if you, if you have those three, there better be smoking as well. So then you have two factors for thrombotic events. <clears throat> there always is a clue, there always will be a clue, either ultrasound or hepatic vein scan or angiography or something to tell you that this is most likely thrombotic or cirrhosis. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Estrogen. Estrogen. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the same thing. It's just a preferred name for it. So when you say hepatic vein thrombosis, that means it could be thrombosis but no symptoms. But Chiara is chronic hepatic thr vein thrombosis. <coughs> okay? Let me ask you this. At 35, no, you know what? Let's just confuse you. A 40 year old female complains of right upper quadrant pain. I mean, we haven't gone to liver yet, but you just asked me something early. 
those of you who have we haven't gone there so just understand it okay you're not responsible for that upper quarter pain <coughs> um, is broad to ER because of <coughs> uh, vomiting blood let's say let's say dark blood okay Her heart rate is 130 beats per minute. Blood pressure is 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury. <coughs> On physical examination, her liver is palpable, one centimeter below below <clears throat> the coast of phrenic angle let's say or ribs whatever rib that is rib 10 okay rib 10 because 11 and 12 are floating they never come to that that level okay now what is <clears throat> the cause of so now and i should tell you like she has esophageal varus let's say i tell you that what is the cause of her esophageal varus i'll give you one was hepatic vein thrombosis and the other one was cirrhosis cirrhosis okay and c is oral contraceptive pills intake and d is alcohol and e is portal hypertension and F is smoke, <coughs> and G is estrogen, or being female, female gender. What do you think? Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. What's, the, what's the answer? The oh, what's the last part? To say? I'm asking you oh. to give me the answer. No, you no, want no, me to... The question? Yeah. the question is, what is the cause of her? It's I feel very Cause? Cause, cause, cause. Thing. A, that's one. B, that's two. Excellent, I love it. We're increasing in number. Let's go. More. Who's confident? Are you confident? Okay, E it is. Because both hepatic vein thrombocirrhosis causes what? Portal hypertension. It's the portal hypertension that causes varices. That causes varices. That causes varices. Now, let me erase that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me erase that. What do you think now? Cirrhosis. Confident? Yes. Cirrhosis. Wait. Okay. That's what he's saying. Oh. Yeah, I didn't say yet. Cirrhosis. Cirrhosis. Anything else? A. A. What is A? Hepatic vein thrombosis? Why is it cirrhosis? Okay. Okay. Why is it hepatic vein thrombosis? Because she has hepatic Ah, excellent. There you go. But there's no, there's no specified use of oral contraceptives, and she's four years old. Okay. Tell him. There's also no history of alcohol in the question. I like this lawyer things. Keep going at it. Good job. This is considered alcoholic. A lot of the times as well too. This is not as esophageal varices. He's saying there's no evidence that this is cirrhosis. There's no history of alcohol intake anything. And he's saying there's no, no, no. You're saying there's no history of alcohol. He's saying there's no history of oral contraceptive or smoking. But at least she's a female. Yeah, she already has the estrogen. Female is likely to drink more or, ha or ha oh, take birth control pills. So that's one thing. But the most important thing is liver is palpable. See, in cirrhosis, what happens to liver? It shrinks. In hepatic vein thrombosis, what happens to liver? It's congestive, it's full of fluid, it enlarges. So I told you, there will be information, that's all. There are, there's always information in the question. Can you see it or not? That would be the thing. So we don't know, we haven't talked about liver, so those of you, don't get nervous. We haven't gone to the liver yet. So this is the most important thing. And then the female, you can add to it. Okay, so this is for sure A. So between the 
<coughs> well, E, look, hepatic vein thrombosis or cirrhosis both lead to what? Portal hypertension. And what is the underlying cause of portal hypertension? Yeah. Portal hypertension. Portal hypertension. Now, <clears throat> anything that leads to obstruction of fluid or blood flow through the portal vein is portal hypertension. Anything. <coughs> anything. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Any other question? Good job. See? Because of you, people are now more aware of this condition. Yeah. Second one. Amazing. Yeah. Can you find anything else? I searched Did anybody find oh I give you homework, right? Yeah, yeah. The homework was that one, right? Yeah. Anything else? No, the week before there was something else. Before. Anyways, so what's the bacteria? Uh, there's only staph epidermis and staph aureus. So what would you choose? Epidermis. There you go. Aureus, you told me was wrong on Friday, so <laughs> <laughs> Staph epidermidis is by far the most common cause of all abdominal shunts. How come? Now, <clears throat> the thing with staph aureus is staph aureus is primarily in the skin and it has to be introduced. Staph epidermidis is the most common cause of, <clears throat> see, staph aureus will be the cause of infection in normal people. Epidermidis always proceeds some procedures, always. Okay, always procedures. Now, those of you who did neurology, those of you who have done neurology, you know that there was something known as a shunt between the abdomen end and uh, CSF. Do you remember that shunt? Yeah. People who had increased intracranial pressure, you make a shunt between the abdomen and that area. Yeah, peritoneum is correct. What's the second part? Transabdominal cranial shunt. Okay. So now in this shunt, <clears throat> what's the most common cause of infection of that shunt? Same thing, staph epidermidis. So I, I was thinking you guys would remember those of you who take neurology. Okay. So same thing. Okay, abdominal shunt, staph epidermidis, and then staph aureus. <coughs> staph aureus, unless there's a trauma or unless there is, you know, something else, otherwise no. Or somebody has osteomyelitis and something like that. Okay, let's move on to, oh, did I answer your question? Thanks. Mm. Anything else? No more questions? Yes, yes, no so for Wednesday, for Wednesday, you guys be witness. These first five students have to have questions. These first five students. For Friday, the next five students. And then for Monday, the following, the next five students. Okay? You have to have questions. That means you study before. But anyways, we, I'm going to start giving you questions. So you have something to follow up at home. And you will have somebody, like, literally on your case every day. Okay? Because we have to use the name Academy, you know, like, let's make it Academy. <laughs> that was the whole idea. It should have been strict, but it completely the opposite. I love in free, I believe in freedom, but, you know, not to the extent that it is not good for you. Okay. All right, let's go to stomach. We're done with esophagus. Let's move on to stomach. Before I move on to stomach, any questions about esophagus? No? Okay. <clears throat> Stomach is located, first of all, in the abdomen, the left upper quadrant. Okay, diffuse esophageal spasm. Am I going to go over it? Should I? Okay. <laughs> diffuse esophageal spasm. So think of this being esophagus. Okay. <clears throat> the esophagus has smooth muscle, correct? 
two layers of smooth muscle. And in some cases, the smooth muscle is thicker. So when you have esophageal hypertrophy, is now you listening to me? Good. Because I want to make sure you're crunching the whatever you're eating, not disturbing between me and you, you know? <laughs> what are you eating? Lava? Back lava? What are you eating? Grapes. Grapes. Oh, that's nice. She wants to get drunk early in the morning. <laughs> Should you guys ask her the guilt questions? What are the questions for alcohol? Cage questions. Cage. C. Are you cutting off? Do you feel like you have to cut off on your um, grapes? No? Okay. Positive. <laughs> I love grapes too. Okay. Now, there's the thing, guys. So, and uh, esophageal hypertrophy, that's one thing. Or the esophagus becomes so sensitive that cold, spicy food, sodas, special sodas, okay? Sometimes you're being nervous. Sometimes you're being, you know, um, anxious about something. The esophagus go through spasm. It's almost like hypersensitivity, but it's not. The esophagus is very sensitive to certain things. It could be cold. It could be smoke. It could be many factors, especially certain foods, okay, and stress, especially stress. And contributing to all of these are immotility, when you're not doing something for a long time, you're just relaxed. Because esophagus is, your esophagus used to contracting frequently, now when you relax, it's not used to it, and it can go through the spasm. At the end of the day, the cause is unknown, it's idiopathic. The cause is unknown, it's idiopathic, but there are triggers, there are triggers. There are things that will cause spasm of the esophagus. So when the esophagus goes through spasm, it cannot contract properly. Imagine when your leg or your foot or your whatever muscle goes through spasm. How do you feel? Tingling, numbness, and painful. Can you actually do any movement or activity? Not really. Same thing. So it doesn't. the esophagus is contracting because of spasm, but it's spastic contraction. Spastic contraction is ineffective when it comes to peristalsis. So at the end of the day, peristalsis does not occur. It's almost like esophagus just shaking. It's just shaking. At the end of the day, you will see on barium, <coughs> corkscrew like esophagus. So it's really not contracting one area. Look, peristalsis wave, if it starts here, it's supposed to move down. For example, we've t we seen this one. Remember, this is the peristaltic wave. So everywhere the esophagus is closed, here it's not. And this wave, this bubble, should keep moving down, 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 down. So uniformly... Peristalsis starts here and it keeps going down, 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 down. But if you have peristalsis here, 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 I'm pushing from this side, you're pushing from this side, nothing is happening. Okay, so <clears throat> the reason diffuse esophageal spasm is a problem because the peristalsis is ineffective. It's ineffective. At the end of the day, you will have dysphagia. You will have dysphagia. Not only that, you will have tightness in your chest and pain. Okay. Esophageal spasm, unlike other things, you will have dis diffuse pain. Not necessarily going to the left shoulder, right shoulder. It's diffuse pain in the chest area. Okay? <clears throat> and maybe you give the muscle relaxing or something like that. No. So, <clears throat> if it's nerve degeneration, it's neuropathy. It's esophageal neuropathy. That means the esophagus is not moving at all. Okay? So, but in some cases, you can have minor damage to nerves diffusely all over. Yeah, it can lead to it. But this is actually spasm. So you have too much firing of the nerve, or you have too much thick muscle that is contracting inequivocally. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this usually is very common in young female. Much more common in young female. So, and scleroderma can put you at this risk. Scleroderma can put you at this risk. Okay, <clears throat> so, yeah, degeneration is different than denervation. See, degeneration, that means the nerves are slowly deteriorating. When it's a nerve is cut off, that's a completely different thing. Let me tell you. Let me tell you how it's different. <clears throat> so, when you have vagus nerves giving its branches, when, it's, when we say denervation or no nerve supply, it's the nerve is cut off. This esophagus can no, no longer contract at all. But when you have the terminal branches of these nerves, what's the myenteric plexus? It's independent of vagus. 
My enteric plexus is not a vagus nerve. Vagus nerve simply controls it. My enteric plexus are its own nervous system. So the GI has its own nervous system, right? If the my enteric plexus is slowly degen degenerating, that means degeneration means slowly. It's not suddenly. It's very progressive. So maybe this nerve is done, and there's still a lot of nerves left. So there's partial nervation and partial denervation kind of thing. So at the end of the day, the, <clears throat> the signal is not reaching completely. So we'll go through spasm. Okay? Which is much different than when you're having a nerve cut off. You're correct. Yeah. If you said that, you're correct. Nerve degeneration is correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Nothing? Done? Move on? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, sometimes, lately I've been hearing things differently. Let's start with Muhammad. <laughs> you start with him. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, let's do this. If that helps, I don't know. But then I'll have... Do you guys know who's Anderson Cooper? His ears are like this. So I don't oh, yeah, want to have ears like... You know, I don't want to have his type of ears. Right? <clears throat> okay. So let's start with stomach. Let's start with embryology of the stomach first. Let's start with embryology of the stomach. Remember that we had... Stomach comes from which which part? Gut tubes. Four gut. This was four gut tube. Now the four gut tube starts dilating, expanding in one region. Okay, so maybe I should do this and then do this. So the four gut start dilating. It starts expanding on this side first, and on this side slower. So if you look at it now, you can think about it this way. Okay. <clears throat> you see it expanded. Now initially, before I even go there, let me do this. <clears throat> the anterior foregut has anterior vagus nerve or right vagus nerve. Okay, so you have the vagus nerve here supplying left and right. So th this is your left or right, this one? Right? Okay. You're right. I'm right? So this is left, this is right. Now there will be a vagus nerve supplying this and the right vagus nerve supplying this side of the foregut tube. Okay, so remember that. I'm, I have to erase it because I have no option. Just remember that. <clears throat> okay, now the stomach starts expanding or this area of the foregut tube starts expanding. And if it starts expanding at the end of the day, during the fifth week, you will see something like this. It's no longer just like a straight tube. This specific area is more dilated, right? <clears throat> don't worry about it. You don't have to know this part, okay? Uh, you, you would have to understand it. In order for stomach to develop from a narrow tube, it has to expand. It's logic. It's common sense. You don't even have to memorize. Now further, <clears throat> the growth of the left side, the left curve. You see this curve? The left side? <clears throat> Maybe I have to use yellow. This curve will grow much faster then the right or green curve. It grows much faster. Okay, When it grows faster, obviously this area will become much, much bigger. And this area will not. So that, that this area of the stomach is also, this area becomes, it pushes it upward. Okay, so... <clears throat> This area grows much faster. The left curvature grows much, much faster. And then this curvature does not grow that fast. And that's why the stomach has the shape it has. So there is... The left curvature grows much faster than the right curvature. So it becomes much bigger. Much, much bigger. Okay? And that's why we call it the greater curvature now and lesser curvature. Good? Also at the same time, the stomach rotates 90 degrees left to right. It also rotates 90 degrees left to right, meaning that <clears throat> this area that used to be left curve, left surface is now the anterior surface because it rotated 90 degrees. That means the nerve that was supplying the left curvature, the left side, is now right here on the front. 
So the left vagus nerve, so now we can say this way. The anterior surface of the stomach is supplied by which nerve? Left vagus. And the posterior surface by who? Right vagus. Used to be the left and right surfaces. Now it's turned. It turned 90 degrees. So, therefore, the nerves also extends with them. Okay, so that's one thing we need to understand from this. <clears throat> okay, so are we okay with the nerve supply of stomach? Anterior surface, left vagus nerve. Posterior surface, right vagus nerve. Okay, that's all. That's 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 all there is to embryology of stomach. <laughs> nothing else. There's nothing else. Okay. All right. Let's do now. Let's move on to gross anatomy. As we understand, stomach looks like this. So here you have. Imagine always when I do this. This is a thickening of the smooth muscle so this is the pyloric sphincter so stomach has two doors one door you can enter which is the LES right so this is the LES that's the entrance in the exit is pyloric sphincter sphincter Okay, <clears throat> now stomach, just like the rest of the GI, is also made of three layers, going from out N serosa, muscularis, mucosa, serosa, muscularis, mucosa, okay, same things. Now the columnar is, I mean the columnar is epithelium, the epithelium is columnar <laughs> instead of squares, <laughs> okay, so the epithelium is columnar epithelium, okay. Good. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about going from outside in. Serosa is the same thing as before. Connective tissue, it's mostly for protection. Connective tissue, the outermost layer, it's mostly for protection. That's the serosa layer. Okay. <clears throat> Second thing, muscularis. In esophagus, you have two layers. In stomach, you have three layers of smooth muscles. Three layers. Longitudinal, circular, and oblique. See, when you have a single tube, it can only squeeze up and down and constrict and dilate. Right? So it can constrict and dilate, elongate or shorten. That's what the esophagus could do for it to cause peristalsis, right? And again, think of, as I said, if you have those long, you know what the, I don't know why I watch these shows sometimes, or I do, it just sticks in my mind. You know how they make hot dogs? Okay, so... <clears throat> It's a long tube. What's that tube made of? Intestine. So those of you who think that you don't eat intestine, when you eat hot dog, you're eating intestine. So that intestine is cleaned and so forth, and the inner layer is taken, then you, what do you do? You fill it up with meat, beef, chicken, turkey, whatever that is. And then what do they do? They hold it here and they squeeze it like this. And then to push that little piece all the way to the bottom. This is peristalsis. Now, to do that for the esophagus, it has to shorten to push, and it has to squeeze to push. Okay. Now, stomach doesn't do that. Stomach does all. Stomach goes almost like... My grandma used to make these things. I don't know if you guys know. Um, Arab calls it laban. In, in Southeast Asian, daisies call it lassi. Yeah. We call it doh or, or terwe. So, they would you take the goat skin and put a lot of yogurt in there. And put some water and then just shake it back and forth. Oh my God. My grandma used to do that. Imagine, this is what the stomach does. It contracts in all directions. Like you're punching it from 20 different directions. At the end of the day, it's, the acid can splash against the LES. There's food churning and twisting and all that. So for stomach to do movement in all directions, you have to have 3D muscles. In all directions, which means oblique in angulated fashion. Circular, to squeeze it. Longitudinal, to constrict it. So stomach has three muscles. The smooth muscle is made of three muscles. Okay? Oblique, circular, longitudinal. I mean, it makes sense. It's common sense. Once you, once you, once you force yourself to think, I guarantee you don't have to uh, memorize. You just have to force, like, why? How, how does the stomach work? You know, just you think about it. Okay, so we're okay with muscularis. Okay, and we're okay with serosa. Let's go to mucosa. Now, mucosa has many layers. The direct mucus 
<coughs> membrane is I mean uh, is epithelium epithelium columnar simple columnar epithelium this columnar epithelium has rugae what is rugae folds it's folded to increase now think about it empty stomach is what small full stomach is what big for something to expand and contract they must have folds when you want to squeeze something and make it smaller that means you have to fold it so naturally stomach should have what folds on the inner side folds and that is to increase the surface area as well yeah the mucosa is stratified or no simple yeah it has a basal layer but it's not stratified yeah. so it can regenerate <coughs> so mucosa is a vascular mucosa is a vascular it's sitting on a basement membrane and you guys have a beautiful picture in your book and then beyond that is vessels beyond the basement membrane and then you have submucosa submucosa should have <coughs> mucus glands okay mucus gland and it should have a smooth muscularis mucosa layer as well which will cause these glands to squeeze so you can secrete stuff and close and open the gap so you can absorb and secrete stuff okay so remember that muscularis mucosa is only for secretion primarily secretion but a little bit absorption too or movement Movement of molecule. The best way to define muscular mucosa is to allow movement of molecules in and out in water and everything else. <clears throat> but muscular propria is only for peristalsis. Only peristalsis. Only peristalsis. Same thing as before. You should have myenteric plexus in the muscular propria, and you should have Meissner's plexus in the muscular mucosa layer. Okay, same thing. Nothing changes until all the way till anal canal. It's the same thing. So you don't have to mem keep memorizing for each part of the intestinal tract. Okay. All right. So these layers you have to memorize. Now, before we go further, I want to, def to understand the stomach is divided into three areas. You see this top part is known as the fundus. The fundus. And this narrow part is known as the antrum. Antrum. Okay. The end of the antrum is known as pylorus. This whole thing is known as antrum. So I'll just do this. <clears throat> this whole area is known as yellow, is known as antrum. But the end of antrum is also known as pylorus. <clears throat> pylorus canal. This is pylorus canal. And then the blue is pylorus sphincter. Okay. Green would be fundus and blue is the body so at least we have to be able to recognize two things body <coughs> fundus Fundus also means top or head for these shallow organs, not solid organs. Okay, Even for liver, you can say it has a fundus. So fundus, body, and antrum. But there's one area I, I didn't do it. Let me just do it right now. Um, this area. Uh-oh. My drawing is not good, but you can think about it. This area. This area is known as cardia because it's related to the heart. Cardia. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you wanna, I mean, there should be two names. <coughs> the most proper name is, you're correct, in a sense, some people use it. The most common name is lower esophageal sphincter. The second most proper name is gastro esophageal sphincter. And then you, when you say cardio, cardiac sphincter, or cardio actually the region. Cardio is not a sphincter. Yeah. So the sphincter is located in the cardiac region or the cardia of stomach. Yeah. Because, uh, Valves, heart has stone valves too, you have to be careful not to confuse it. But this region where the sphincter is located, the whole region is known as cardia. Okay. But the sphincter is not known as cardia. Yeah. Remember that the sphincter is located within the cardia. Just read it one more time. Yeah, the sphincter is located within the cardia. So you can synonymously use it, but it does not mean the sphincter. Okay, yeah. Let's say in the neck of this bottle, the neck of the, this bottle, you call it the neck. But the valve, the opening is not in the neck, but it's not the neck itself, right? Yeah. Kingsley. Uh, maybe I'm adding to what I was reading. Is there a difference 
Can you, is it really cold outside? Can you turn off this thing? It's really. Yeah, sorry. I just want to turn this thing off because it's. Yeah, I'm going there right now. Of course, I'm going there right now. Yeah. Okay. So at least superficially, you know, you should know different areas of the stomach, right? Fundus, cardia, body, antrum, pylorus, and pyloric sphincter, and gastroesophageal sphincter. You should know those. Sphincters are supposed to prevent things from coming back. Okay. <clears throat> all right, all right. Okay, now let's move on to something else. Let's see, how can I do this? <coughs> so you guys know the area. I don't have to color them again, right? <coughs> okay. So in terms of cells, we should memorize cells now. We're going to physiology and histology of the stomach now. What does stomach really do? See, stomach has these cells, tall cells, columnar cells. You can call them M cells or mucus cells. These cells produce what? Mucus, which is bicarbonate. Okay? They're more prominent, especially in the fundus area. Okay? Within them, you would have other cells that are more specialized columnar cells. Again, they're still columnar cells, but they're specialized columnar cells. And they will have more villi and microvilli. These are known as parietal cells, green cells. Okay, so these green cells are known as parietal cells. Parietal cells. These yellow cells are known as. Uh oh. One of them is leaking. Uh -huh. So the green cells produce HCl and intrinsic factor. That's the green cells, parietal cells. Okay. Huh? I need this area because you guys write parietal because I need this area for receptors. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, they're located in the body and fundus. All over the stomach, especially in the body. Yeah. It does. The HCL, look, when you say directly, HCL and, and, and um, chloride are both released by them. N none of these cells have the ability to produce it from nothing. You get it from blood. So when you say directly and directly, what they're telling you when you read these books, so the protein is actually grabbed because of bicarbonate. That's what they say. So it's within, within the parietal cells, the proton is separated from bicarbonate. <coughs> So that's what they mean by directly, but actually it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and proton chloride is secreted separately. They're not secreted together. Okay, so there will be a pump called proton pump. You know what? Let's just do that. I love when people read the book because Okay. Astra. So So look, there's a pump, right? This is known as proton pump. Okay, this proton pump secretes bicarbonate, including some HCl. I mean, sorry, hydrogen and some A chloride. Okay, but this pump actually pumps, chloride will come itself, but uh, what is pumped is the hydrogen ion, and they combine together. Okay, because one is positive, one is negative, so just to maintain the electromagnetic charges, that's why. Okay, so intrinsic factors uh, secreted separately. Now, <clears throat> That's for this. There should be another group of cells. Let's use red for that. And these are known as chief cells. Red one is known as chief cells. Chief cells. Chief cells produce pepsinogen. Very good. Pepsinogen. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. There's no really combination. So, again, these things will be irrelevant for, for example, in terms of medicine. It makes no difference. 
but I'll tell you for for satisfaction of you to understand what's going on. In water, when you put salt in water, you can write sodium chloride. But in water, electrolytes are never attached. Never attached. So this, as soon as you put them in water, it'll be sodium, positive. Chloride, negative. <coughs> Same thing with HCl. It's simple for us to write it together, you know, like as if it's one thing, but it's really not one thing. In, in water, this acid dissolves. In water, all acid dissociate, all bases dissociate. Acid and bases are strong solvents. They dissolve very strongly, very easily, I should say, very easily. Okay? And they'll split into hydrogen ion and chloride immediately. So, <clears throat> they, even in the stomach, they don't exist as together. They exist negative and positive charges. Okay? The only thing is you need the protons, not the chloride, the protons to activate pepsin. That's what it is. You need this hydrogen ion to activate pepsin. But <clears throat> if you don't, I mean, it's if, who knows the reality exactly. If you don't accompany a positive ion with a negative ion, then the electric charge is imbalanced. That will lead to depolarization of the membrane. So that's the reason chloride is accompanying uh, hydrogen ion. Otherwise, it's no reason. It has no other purpose. Just to maintain the electron negativity of extracellular fluid versus the intracellular fluid. Remember that. We talked about this. If the outside becomes too negative, then what happens to depolarization? It wouldn't occur. So you must maintain membrane potential at all costs. Always, all cells, the inner side of the membrane, the inner side of the membrane should be negative compared to outside. So if you disturb that, that leads to a lot of firing and a lot of things can be secreted. You don't even need the nervous system to do its job because it does it by itself. Does it make sense? Yeah. So <clears throat> whether they secrete it together or not does not matter because at the end of the day, they are separate. But yet they are secreted together. I mean separate, sorry. It's the proton that's pumped. The pump is only for proton, not for chloride. Chloride simply follows the, the hydrogen ion. Yeah. So when a person's on a parasol and the proton pump is inhibited, chloride won't be used at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It will, it will affect chloride too? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So now, mucus cells, I'll put M. Parietal cells, P. I want to put P somewhere else. So mucus cells, and this is green as parietal cells, P cells, and then red was chief cells. Please memorize the name. Chief cells, parietal cells, mucus cells. Good? All right. They're all columnar cells. It's just some of them are specialized. They look a little bit different. Okay, they have specific name because they have specific product. Specific product. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> now the next thing is this, let me erase this so that it, will, it makes more sense for us, intrinsic factor, I'll just use one arrow, okay, so it's easier for me, so I need more room, okay, right here in the antrum of stomach, you have G cells, I'll put G, Okay, G cells. In the antrum of stomach, you have G cells. In these G cells, you can call them gastrin cells, okay? G stands for gastrin. They're, they're gastrin cells. Okay, gastrin cells is supposed to produce what? Gastrin. Gastrin. <clears throat> okay, so so far we know one, two, three, four cells. Four cells are important in the stomach. But st stomach has these folds in the inside. If this is a fold, you see this area? It's called a crypt. Crypt. <clears throat> like a, you have mountains and inside is a valley. The valley itself will be called a crypt. Okay, so the crypts. In the crypts, you have mucus cells, for example, here. And then you also have something that is pennant cells. Pennant cells. These cells are immune cells. 
immune cells. They defend against microbes, pennate cells, which usually are located in the slightly in the bottom of these crypts. Okay. From stomachs, you have these air deep invagination on the scripts because it has a lot of folding. So in the bottom of the scripts, you have <clears throat> you you should have again mucus cells on the top. You should have in, in the center. You should have pepsinogen cells, and then you should have penis cells in the bottom bottom. They're supposed to be immune cells. Okay. Um, you are responsible for tomorrow, even though I'm not going to be here. Number one, to look up all the possible slides, true slides. We don't need a microscope these days, okay? Because the pictures, you can see them on your computers. So back in the days, we didn't have computers in this. We used to use microscopes. Now, so I want you to know the histology of esophagus in all aspects. And, and whoever, Shukrullah is here with you guys tomorrow. I'll inform him to look it up and, and help you guys with that and interpret them. Okay, if you have something else, at least for Wednesday, I'll help you. So histology and anatomy, I'm going to give you guidelines, and there should be somebody helping you all the time. Okay? For esophagus. Yeah. We'll, we'll give it some time. One day for esophagus. And then the next, next uh, Tuesday or Thursday, we'll do, for example, some stomach and some pancreas. Okay? So you got to know this normal slide. Please compare. Now, what I'm telling you is you have to look up histological slides for each of those things we discussed in, uh, in the esophageal diseases. Abnormal versus normal. First, you have to memorize and understand the normal slide. What do they look like? What kind of cells? How, what is the difference when you look under the microscope or on the picture? You know, these days no microscopes need to see a picture on your computer. Google it. Squamous cells, how do they differ from columnar cells? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Gastrins. Now, so, so far, this is the histology. Four cells. Can you memorize them? Okay. The functionality of this is known as physiology. How do they work? Why do you even have so many different types of cells? What time is it? Let's go on a little bit more. Now, let's say you eat food. Okay, so there's the food particle coming. Food particle coming. Okay, so this food bolus is reaching the stomach. Good? Usually a food bolus is made of carbs, protein, lipids, minerals, and so forth, right? And vitamins. Okay. Now, let's write down one thing. You, you should write it right now. <clears throat> the most important side of protein digestion is the stomach. Okay? Protein. Remember we talked about pro how you absorb amino acids and all that? Now we're getting you the prerequisite, how do even you provide amino acids to cells to do something with it. So in the oral cavity, about maybe 5 to 3, three to 5% of protein are digested in the oral cavity. About 3 to 5, small amount is absorbed and digested in the oral cavity. The primary site of protein digestion is stomach, 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 stomach. Okay. Lipids and carbs in stomach, not much. So if you want to understand what is the function of stomach, to break down proteins, to break down proteins primarily, primarily. Okay, so the major function of stomach is to break down proteins. And also it's a major site of alcohol absorption. Alcohol absorption. Okay, stomach. Stomach where alcohol is absorbed and proteins are broken down. But does that mean there's zero absorption and digestion of other particles? No, we don't believe in such things, remember? Physiology, there's no zero or 100%. There's always how much. So it's insignificant. What I'm telling you is other stuff like carbs, lipids, and, and nucleotides, they're insignificant. Okay? Whereas protein absorption, I mean, uh, protein breakdown is huge. Huge, huge, huge. Okay. So let's say this food particle comes. Now, this food particles, let's say, should... When you break it, when you chew it, and you do stuff, and it comes in contact with stomach acid, so I'm sure there will be some fatty acid that will be released. Not a lot, some. I'm sure, and you're sure, and I'm sure, there will be some amino acid that will be released, or peptides. And we're sure there will be some glucose. At the end of the day, G cells, G cells, have on them amino acid receptors. Or sometimes amino acid can be transported, so... 
when they come in contact with amino acids, fatty acids, immediately they get activated or low pH. Okay, when they get activated, so <clears throat> they will release gastrin. Now I'm telling you what activates G cells. Fatty acid, fatty acid, amino acid, bicarbonate or low pH. I mean, sorry, high pH, high pH, mm. high pH. Mm -hmm. More acidic or less acidic? Less acidic. Less acidic. Yeah, high pH. Okay. Now, if you understand what the purpose of gastrin, automatically you can make a conclusion on your own. For now, just quickly let's memorize. Food particles activates G cells. Food particle activates G cells. Distension of the stomach activates G cells. So there's two factors. Food particles, those are chemoreceptors. And then you have baroreceptors on the G cells, which is distension, stretching, contraction. That would make complete sense to me. That means it's a signal for food. As soon as I have food, G cells should get activated. If there's no food, they shouldn't. That's amazing. That's crazy. Like, you know, they are so well designed. They will only secrete and produce gastrin when you need to. When you really need to. And that is when you have food. So it can cause digestion of food. Otherwise, why should they waste? energy and, and peptides and such called gastrin. Okay, so that's one thing. <clears throat> now, stomach in itself has stretch receptors. Stretch receptor. As food comes, it also activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so um, let me tell you something. Stomach has two types of receptors overall. I mean, the cells are part of the stomach, right? So when I say stomach, I'm talking about all cells. Cells have stretch receptors, stretch, and chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors, which responds to chemical concentration of things. Stretch receptor, which responds to distension, contact, stretching. So when you are in swallowing food, the whole signal starts in the esophagus. When the esophagus is distended, it, release, it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which releases a lot of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Okay. Now to understand this, which is true of the entire stomach, but let's... Do this. You see these parietal cells? Green. Parietal cells on the surface, they have three receptors. Acetylcholine receptor. Okay? Acetylcholine, not acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Hmm. Okay? <clears throat> they also have histamine receptors. Okay? Now, you know what? I'll label them appropriately. Okay, so the histamine receptor is known as H2. It's known as H2. H2 receptor. Not H1, never. H2 is primarily found in the stomach. Primarily found in the stomach. So therefore, you can use it specifically to your advantage. And then you have acetylcholine receptors are known as muscarinic. Muscarinic. And let's call them M receptor. Muscarinic receptors. Okay, muscarinic receptors. And then let's do the third one, blue, G receptor or gastrin receptor, gastrin receptor. So parietal cells have three receptors, three receptors, three receptors. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Interchromophone cells, yeah. Yeah. Interchromophone cells actually produces histamine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now, <clears throat> let's say you eat food. As you're eating food, what happens to esophagus and stomach? It distends. And that is automatically stimulation of what? Parasympathetic nervous system. Automatically activation, stimulation of parasympathetic nervous system. Now, Nervous system, you know, you can think on your own, right? So that means the nervous system responds not only to physical stimuli, but to non-physical, metaphoric stimuli that we, we can't explain. Now, if you think of food, what, nervous, what part of the body is stimulated? Parasympathetic, when you think of food, when you smell something good, when you visualize something good. You know, these commercials are based on that. Commercials are based on vision, and it stimulates what? 
they're sympathetic. You're like, oh my God, I want that burger. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, the parasympathetic nervous system, autonomic nervous system, could be activated, and it is, by smell, by vision, by hearing, by thinking. Okay. So, in this instance, when you're eating, the smell of the food, and then the taste of the food, and then the direct contact of the food, with your esophageal and gastric mucosa does what? Activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And they will release what? Acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is supposed to activate what? In this case, everywhere you have muscarinic receptors. So acetylcholine, acetyl, acetylcholine. Okay, so this will activate the muscarinic receptor. That means parietal cells will release what? HCL and intrinsic factor. The function of parietal cells is only two things for now. Only two things. Parietal cells only produce two things. HCL, intrinsic factor. HCL, intrinsic factor. If you activate them, what are they going to do? Those two. <laughs> I mean, that's their job. The job of parietal cell is to produce two things. Intrinsic factor and HCL. If a factory is designed to produce ice cream and you ring the bell, it's going to only produce ice cream or you activate it. This factory is known as parietal cells. It makes only two things, honey. Thank you for the contact because then I get more motivated. Okay. So now, <clears throat> when, they, when, you, when you have a factory that produces HCL, an intrinsic factor, if you activate it, it's going to produce that, nothing else. That's common sense. Okay. So acetylcholine will increase. And that's the first one actually that acts on it. Now the second thing is, let's say, food comes as far as G cells, and it comes in contact with G cells. G cells will produce what? Gastrin. Gastrin is hormone. Gastrin is a hormone. Remember that. A hormone. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. Difference. There's a huge difference. Hormones are always secreted into blood excellent excellent so this hormone will be secreted into blood most likely into veins not arteries okay <clears throat> all right so now through blood it will travel all the way this hormone will travel through blood and will act on what g receptor of parietal cells and then it causes what it activates the parietal cells when you activate parietal cells what are parietal cells going to do produce HCL and intrinsic factor. Now, this is this will duplicate it. There's more. You know, whenever you have, if you have a safe box that have three locks, what does that mean? It's, it's very important. important. You, you're keeping something very highly secretive or, or valuable. In physiology, when something is regulated by more than one thing, that means it's important. Very, very important. Okay? All right. There are local cells, according to Zach, and he's good and accurate, interchromophon cells. These cells, when it comes in contact, and they're spread all over the place. Okay, interchromophon cells. Let's do it here. Or you can call them mast cells. So these are local mast cells. Local mast cells. Okay. These cells produce histamine. Atropine? Yeah. Can you be patient? Can you be patient for a while? Yeah. Because it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's perfect. Great medication. It has huge significance. Very good. But I just have to finish this. I'll tell you. Okay. So now, these mast cells, what do they produce? Histamine. histamine. But they will produce histamine only when? When they come in contact with what? with the same food or ACL cells, yeah? So they will produce, again, if they come in contact with the amino acid, fatty acid, or food particle, or they distend it. Now, these guys can themselves be activated by acetylcholine as well. Acetylcholine activates them too. So histamine will activate what? H2 receptor. Now, there are three things that activates parietal cells. Histamine through H2 receptor gastrin through G receptor 
acetylcholine through muscarinic or amyl receptor. Okay, that's all. Acetylcholine is a key, muscarinic receptor is a lock. So acetylcholine opens that lock. H2 receptor is a lock, histamine is a key. It opens it and then it allows HCL to be secreted. Think of it that way. Hormone and receptors are always a key and lock. Always. Okay, now, <clears throat> the thing is, M receptors are all, also found on chief cells. So acetylcholine is the major regulator over all of the gastric secretions. So acetylcholine will also activate what? Chief cells to produce what? Pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. Histamine will also do that. Okay, the only thing gastrin doesn't is not known to act, but maybe partially. Okay. Now, pepsinogen... Whenever you hear this term gen, G-E-N, there are enzymes known as zymogen. The term zymogen, write it down, zymogen. Zymogen. This term is used for inactive enzyme. Zyme, enzyme, gen, inactive. That means you have to generate the active form. Zymogen is not generated yet. Okay, so zymogen. So pepsinogen is a zymogen. Zymogen is a general term for all enzymes that are inactive. Not just for one, for all of them. A group of enzymes that are inactive, they're called what? Zymogens. But in pepsinogen, a specific one now, right? It's one of the, that group, a member of that group. You can have trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen. You can have a lot of them. Zymogen is a general term, like students. And then you have male and female, and then they have different functions, different grades, and so forth. So, pepsinogen is inactive. It can't do anything. Pepsinogen is inactive. So <clears throat> you have to release pepsinogen first. And then why do you release it? So it gets activated. In the active form of pepsinogen is what? Pepsin. But for activation of pepsinogen to pepsin, you need HCl, or at least the protons. Who activates pepsinogen to pepsin? HCl, HCl, HCl. Okay. I'll write HCl so you don't get confused. But it's the proton that actually activates it. Nobody cares for that specificity. Okay. All right. So now pepsin is a pepta is a peptidase. Blah, blah, blah. Pepsin is a peptidase. Write it down first. Look at it what it means, and then I'll come back. Understand what pepsin is. Pepsin is a peptidase. A peptidase. Pepsin is peptidase. 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 Peptide means a sequence of amino acid or a smaller protein. You can also call it, so pepsin is protease and peptidase both. What does protease mean to you? An enzyme that breaks down protein. What does peptidase mean to you? Yeah, it's an enzyme that breaks down peptides. Okay. So now when you have pepsin, what happens to the protein that you just ate? Now you can digest it. You can break it. But to have this pepsin, it's that important that you have to regulate by so many different factors. <coughs> Which means this pepsin is crazy. You need leashes on them. You need to protect your mucous membrane because what is your stomach made of? What is your entire body structure made of? Protein. So that means the pepsin can actually digest you. If you don't control it, if you don't control it, it can <coughs> digest you. Because you are a protein, you're a walking protein, and you have this enzyme, I mean, should we call it a shark, or a, whatever you want to call it? Double-edged sword, okay. Okay, <clears throat> now this double-edged sword is, oh, that's becoming difficult for me, I tend to stay away from swords, I'm a peaceful person. Okay, <clears throat> so this enzyme will digest proteins anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. But for this enzyme activity, what do you need? Low pH. The enzyme will be inactive if pH is above 2. This enzyme cannot act in blood. You see there's a defense mechanism. If this enzyme by mistake somehow gets access to blood, what happens to it? It gets deactivated. So it cannot cause digestion of your blood cells and blood vessels. The activity of this enzyme is restricted only to what? To low pH and whatever that might be. Low pH. But as far as we know, it's only stomach. Are you disappointed? No, I'm not. Good. 
2. So pepsin will be inactive, ineffective if pH is about 4, or 5, 6, 7, 8. It's most effective at pH 2. Most. So it's, it's never active at basic pH. It's only active in a low acidic pH. Asra. I forgot what the uh, pH level of the Two. 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 Now, some of you might be having less parietal salts. So your pH will be slightly higher. Okay. Some of you might have a lot of parietal salts. And therefore you have reflux diseases. You have ulcers, so you, your pH must be low. So it depends. Okay, there's a range. As long as it's between, like, let's say, two to four, two to five, it's okay. Okay, so it depends on your level, and what type of person are you, and what do you eat, what you don't eat. You know, every human being physiology is different. So again, it is pepsin that breaks down protein to peptides, peptides to small peptides, or polypeptides to peptides. It's pepsin, 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 pepsin. Pepsin is a protease. Pepsin is a peptidase. HCl only activates it. Now, HCl will dissolve protein to the best of its ability, but not much. You need, at the end of the day, what? Pepsin. Okay. And now, what if pepsin does its job? It does its job, and the protein is digested, or the bunch of protein, group of protein, or a huge volume of protein digested. Then, bicarbonate cells into decreasing pH to low pH bicarbonate is released now bicarbonate is more basic so it will cause what neutralization of pepsin once pepsin does its job then bicarbonate is released now bicarbonate has two functions number one it protects the mucous membrane of the stomach because you don't want pepsin to digest its own producing cells it's like a baby start you know um, killing their own moms so Pepsin is produced by what? Their mother is parietal cells. It will eat the parietal cells if it has access to it. But the access is prevented by what? A coat of mucus. A thick coat of mucus. Okay? Alright, good. So at the end of the day, that means first gastrin, acetylcholine, and histamine, and then HCl, an intrinsic factor, and pepsinogen, and pepsinogen is active to pepsin, and then pepsin will start digesting what? The protein that you just swallowed in your stomach. And when this happens, then your <coughs> mucus cells, M cells, mucus cells will start producing what? Mucus or bicarbonate to neutralize the acidic environment in the stomach and to neutralize pepsin from prevent, preventing it from causing damage to you. If you cannot deactivate pepsin, what happens? Now is the time of application. Why don't you take a break and then you tell me. Questions, right? Related to this? Yeah. So I'm not going to turn it off. Good. Okay. Um, so you first in the Malcolm. Okay. So patients who have anorexia, um, since they like, keep activating their breasts in the setting and looking at food, mm -hmm. so are they more at high risk for all this because of the pepsin being active? Yeah. Yeah, in anorexia, when they vomit, their teeth get eroded faster because they vomit more acid. And that acid is not coated with food. So food itself is going to neutralize acid. And then on top of the bicarbonate, yeah? Of course. That's what I told you. When, you. when you're examining anorexic and bulimic patient, always pay attention to their teeth and their finger and nails and so forth. You will see they're burned, they're, they're cracked, and, it's, and then they will have stretch marks or teeth marks against them and so forth. Yeah, I'm saying, will their pepsin be more... Yeah, the pepsin is going to cause more damage. Yeah, okay. They're more at risk of something. What is that? Okay. Ulcers, yeah. Okay. Malcolm. Okay, so this pathway is like very complex and since they have a high energy domain. Mm -hmm. So where's the source of glucose coming in to activate this orange high pathway or ATP? Where is ATP coming in to activate this entire pathway? Same thing as every other cell. Just every other yeah. but it's just glycolysis and Krebs cycle. But it doesn't do it as much as other parts of the body because you say the stomach is more prone to breaking down proteins as opposed to carbohydrates. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're imagining that glucose should be absorbed directly from stomach into cells. I don't think so. I think but why do... Stomach has its own blood supply. We haven't gone there yet. Okay. How do you deliver nutrition? The whole idea of blood is to deliver nutrition. Yeah. yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Next. Okay. Next. 
So you have to also be patient. Okay. Yeah, coming. Um, <clears throat> next, once I do this, after break, we'll come with medication. One of them was atropine. Okay. Let's take a break, and we'll talk.